I believe history at its best is about telling stories, stories about people who lived before, about events in the past that create the contours of the present. By studying the lives of others, we hope that we, the living, can learn from their struggles and their triumphs. So today I'd like to tell you stories of two of our greatest presidents, Abraham Lincoln and Franklin Roosevelt. For what is so revealing about coupling these two very different people in very different times is the realization that they share some of the same leadership attributes, suggesting that while problems change over time, there are certain universal traits held by leaders, whether in public or in private life. First, it has been said that one of the best indicators of leadership success is the ability to motivate oneself in the face of frustration, to withstand adversity and come through trials of fire. The world breaks everyone, Ernest Hemingway once wrote, but afterward many are strong in the broken places. How true this was for both Abraham Lincoln and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Early on, Lincoln showed that he possessed an unusual determination to rise beyond the adverse circumstances of his childhood on the frontier, where his interest in reading and his love of books was considered a sign of laziness in a physical culture that demand constant efforts to fell the trees, plant the crops, simply survive. His mother died when he was only nine years old, his only sister Sarah in childbirth a few years later, and his first love, Anne Rutledge, at the age of 22. Moreover, as his mother lay dying, she didn't hold out for him the hope that they would meet in an afterworld. She simply said to him, Abraham, I'm going away from you now, and I shall never return. As a result, he became obsessed with the thought that when we die on earth, that is the last of us. Only as he grew older did he find consolation in the thought that if he could accomplish something worthy in his life, he would live on in the memory of others, that one's honor, one's reputation can outlive one's earthly existence. Well, in similar fashion, Franklin Roosevelt had endured his own crucible in the form of the polio attack when he was in his 30s, which left him a paraplegic. The paralysis that crippled his body, however, expanded his mind and his sensibilities. After what Eleanor called his trial by fire, he seemed less arrogant, less smug, less superficial, more focused, more complex, more interesting. He returned from his ordeal with greater powers of concentration and greater self-knowledge. There had been a plowing up of his nature, Labor Secretary Francis Perkins once observed. He emerged completely warm-hearted with a new humility of spirit and a firmer understanding of profound philosophical concepts. He had always taken great pleasure in people, but now they became what one historian has called his vital links with life. Far more intensely than before, he reached out to know people, to understand them, to pick up their emotions, to put himself in their shoes. No longer belonging to his old privileged world in the same way, he came to empathize with the poor and the underprivileged, with people to whom fate had also dealt an unkind hand which allowed him to connect to the people hurt by the economic catastrophe in ways he might never have been able to, given his privileged background. While well, second, both of these leaders were willing to surround themselves with rivals who could question their assumptions. Their inner circles felt free to disagree without the fear of consequence. The night of Lincoln's election as president, he couldn't sleep. He made the decision that would define his presidency to put each of his chief rivals into his cabinet. A less confident man might have surrounded himself with personal supporters who would not have questioned his authority. He was asked, why are you doing this? He said, it's simple. The country is in peril. These are the strongest and most able men in the country. I need them by my side. Well, similarly, Franklin Roosevelt understood the need to bring people of different opinions around him, especially during World War II. He created a coalition cabinet bringing unsparing critics of the New Deal into key positions as his secretaries of war and navy, recognizing that agreement on the central issue of the day, how to defeat Adolf Hitler, was far more important than disagreement on domestic issues. Well, the third leadership trait that they shared was an ability to acknowledge errors and learn from their mistakes. This ability, it has been said, literally turns failure into success. So often not our mistakes that hurt us the most, but our response to those mistakes. When the first big battle of the war at Bull Run turned out to be a terrible route for the Union forces, Lincoln stayed up all night drafting a memo that incorporated the painful lessons of that failure into future military policy. And over and over he'd do that. Something bad happened, he would write down, examine how it happened, which would give him the sustenance to keep moving forward. 
And similarly, Franklin Roosevelt, when he concluded a New Deal program wasn't working, he simply created a new one in its place, built upon an understanding of what had gone wrong. And more importantly, once war was on the horizon, he knew he had to change his relationship with the business community, which had been marked by hostility during the New Deal. So he put out an olive branch to the business community. He knew government couldn't build the ships, the planes, the weapons, and the tanks. Only business could. He guaranteed profits to com companies that were willing to transition from cars to planes and to tanks. He relaxed antitrust regulations, accelerated depreciation, provided tax breaks for building factories, creating, in many ways, the greatest partnership in American history between business and government. While fourth, both these leaders possessed an emotional intelligence in using that modern word, to allow them to share credit for success, to put past grievances aside, to create what has been called an emotional bank account within their inner circle, a reservoir of good feeling. Over and over you see in Lincoln's papers handwritten letters to his cabinet members and people in the government praising them for work well done, telling them that he was wrong about something, they were right, I'm so glad you were right, he once said to Grant. And similarly, when Franklin Roosevelt was talking to his labor secretary, Perkins, she came away and she said, there's something he's got, such that when I'm overwhelmed, I come away from my meeting with him feeling I can do my job because he believes in me, because he's told me what I did so well and maybe I can do it again. And then fifth, when they were angry, they were almost always able to control their emotions. Lincoln had this wonderful ritual called the hot letter, where he'd write a letter to the person he was angry with and all of his emotions would come out and then he'd put it aside, hoping he would cool down psychologically and never need to send it. The famous case of that is when General Meade failed to follow up with General Lee's army after the victory at Gettysburg, despite telegrams going from Lincoln saying, you must not let Lee's army escape. When Lee's army finally escaped, he wrote a long letter to Meade saying, I'm so immeasurably distressed. Had you done what we'd asked you to do, the war might have been over soon. Now it will go on month after month, year after year. But then knowing how much it would hurt the general and more importantly paralyze him, for he was still in the field, he put the letter aside. It wasn't even opened until the 20th century when Lincoln's papers were opened and underneath was the notation, never sent and never signed. Well, FDR at Pearl Harbor exhibited a similar control over his emotions. While his aides and cabinet members after hearing of the attack on Pearl Harbor were running around in panic and excitement, he remained steady, absorbing the news, deciding what to do next. As each new report arrived, carrying news more terrible than the last, he was completely calm. His Secretary of State later said in all the years in which he had seen the President, he had never had such reason to admire him. He reserved his righteous anchor, Roosevelt did, for the speech to a joint session the next day of Congress, which he began with the memorable characterization of December 7th as a date that would live in infamy. Well, sixth, and something we don't always stress enough about leadership qualities, both these men understood how to relax, to replenish their energies, and to shake off anxiety. Lincoln actually went to the theater more than 100 times during his presidency. He said when the lights came down and a Shakespeare play went on the stage, for a few precious hours, he could forget the war that was raging and focus on Shakespeare's wars instead. But his greatest form of relaxation was his unparalleled sense of humor and his gift for storytelling. He had begun becoming a storyteller even when he was a lawyer on the circuit in Illinois, a young lawyer. They would travel for six weeks together, the lawyers, the judges, the bailiffs, from one county courthouse to the other, six weeks in the spring, six weeks in the fall. And Lincoln developed a reputation so that people would come from miles around to listen to him tell funny stories as he would stand in the tavern with his back to a fire. Well, FDR had his own way of relaxing. He had a stamp collection that he loved. He had poker games that he'd play with his cabinet officers. And most importantly, he had a cocktail hour every night during World War II where the rule was you could not talk about the war. You could discuss movies you'd seen, books you'd read, again, like Lincoln, just needing to have a couple hours where he didn't think about the ravages of the war. And after a while, this cocktail hour became so important to him that he wanted the aides and friends who would be at the cocktail hour to actually live in the White House to be ready for it. So the White House became the most exclusive residential hotel you could possibly imagine. Both these men, despite these moments of relaxation, were almost inconceivable. So they both understood, as yet another leadership trait, that at the worst moments of crisis, they had to leave the White House and get out among the people. 
The pressures were probably even greater for Lincoln. He and Stanton would sit in the telegraph office at night waiting for the terrible news that thousands of soldiers had died that day. At such moments, his immediate instinct was to go to the battlefield, to walk amidst the soldiers, to visit the wounded in the hospital, to assess the situation directly and frankly, to bolster morale, to create lasting connections. Well, similarly, Franklin Roosevelt traveled throughout the country during those early days of the war, as I said, visiting factories, shipyards, bolstering the morale of the workers, but even more, getting a feeling for how fast the country could move in what directions by being out among the people. And then their travels away from the White House gave them both a sense of timing, something so central for a leader. Lincoln later said if the Emancipation Proclamation had been signed six months earlier, he would have lost the border states. If it had been signed any later, he would have lost the morale boost it provided. As it was, it was the perfect timing on January 1st, 1863. But there was a problem. He was set to sign it that afternoon, but that morning he'd held a huge New Year's reception in which he had shaken a thousand hands. So when he went to sign the Emancipation Proclamation, his own hand was numb and shaking. He put the pen down. He said, if ever my soul were in an act, it is in this act. But if I sign with a shaking hand, posterity will say he hesitated. So he waited and waited until he could sign with an unusually bold hand. Well, FDR, too, had a special antennae to know when to time his fireside chats on the radio. I thought he was on the radio every week, only to discover that he only delivered 30 fireside chats in his 12 years as president, knowing something our presidents who routinely now give weekly addresses do not know that less is more. And he knew exactly when to communicate to the people. And then finally, both men were able to communicate to their countrymen a central leadership trait with stories, everyday metaphors, and a beauty of language when it was needed. FDR's very first inaugural set the pattern for his entire presidency. It conveyed a clear understanding of the difficulties the nation faced, but projected such serene confidence in the fundamental strength of his countrymen that he renewed hope in millions who sent telegrams and letters saying, everything's going to be all right. You are there, the mystery of leadership. Or later, when he was trying to sell Lend-Lease to the Allies and to the American people first, he came up with a homely metaphor that when your neighbor's house is on fire, you will lend them your hose to save both their house and yours. And that shaped public opinion. And of course, Abraham Lincoln had an unmatched ability to communicate with his countrymen in a series of speeches that still hold their power today after a century and a half. In his day, when he wrote a speech, it would be printed in full in the newspapers. So people would pass it around, it would be pamphletized, and they would really read it. It was the perfect timing for him technologically because he worked so hard on each one of these speeches. It seemed in his speeches almost as if his love of poetry and drama had worked their way into his very soul, giving those speeches a unique beauty and emotional power. Nowhere I believe more beautiful than his second inaugural. Think of it, the North is finally on the eve of winning this long civil war, but no triumphal message does he deliver. On the contrary, he knows his next task is to bring the South back into the Union. So the theme of the inaugural was that the sin of slavery was shared by both sides, he said. Both sides read the same Bible, both prayed to the same God, neither's prayers were fully answered. And then the words we all remember, with malice toward none and charity for all, let us bind up the nation's wounds. Now for most of us, the chance to have our story told may not be realized in a monument in Washington, but rather through the memories of our children, our friends, and our colleagues.